So today we're going to talk about Jesus healing a man that most theologians refer to as the Gadarean demoniac. Wow, how's that for a title? Okay, let me explain where the name comes from. We'll start with the first part of the name, Gadarean. The text opens up by saying that they came to the other side of the sea, to the country of the Gerasenes and the Gadarenes, which is opposite Galilee. Now, both Gerasa and Gadara were cities on the eastern side of the Sea of Galilee, or the Lake of Gennesaret, which is just two different names for the same body of water. We don't have time here to really develop what those two towns represent, but I do want to point out that Gadara bears the name of one of the tribes of Israel, Gad. These two cities have become completely Gentile or non-Hebrew in their makeup. As a matter of fact, these were two of the 10 cities of Alexander the Great that were known as the Decapolis, which just means 10 cities. There was nothing Jewish about these two towns. Or was there? In order to get the context for our story, we have to go back to the 32nd chapter of Numbers. Now, I'm going to paraphrase what happens, but I really think you should go read the story for yourself to get the whole picture. So here's what's happening. The descendants of Israel are about to enter into the Promised Land under the leadership of Joshua. Moses is at the end of his life and the mantle is going to be passed to Joshua as the man in charge. Plans are being set for how the people will cross the river and begin to drive out the inhabitants of the land, which really rightfully belongs to Israel, when Reuben and Gad approach Moses with a plan. They say, we're livestock guys. We've sort of set up shop over here on the eastern side of the Jordan River, and the land is great for our livestock. Why don't you guys go on across and take the promised land for yourself, and there'll just be more to go around. We'll stay back, and we'll keep living the life the way we've been living it. Moses quickly reminds them that war is ahead, and this is exactly the kind of cowardice that caused them to wander around in the wilderness for 40 years when their fathers did the exact same thing. So they pull Moses off to the side and they promise that they'll cross the river and they'll fight. But when the land is settled, they'll return to the eastern side of the Jordan and they'll live life there. Y'all read it. Moses eventually relents and he finishes up in verse 23 with these words. If you do not do so, then take note. You have sinned against the Lord. And be sure your sins will find you out. I guess you figured out what happens next, right? The land is never fully occupied. And Gad and Reuben, they return anyway. Now we're 1,400 years down the road, and there's a city that bears the name of Gad, but Judaism, that's just a distant memory. Now instead of raising sheep and cattle, the local farmers, now they're raising pigs. The heritage of Gad has been absorbed by the sinful and unclean rule of a people who deny God as God. So, welcome to the region of the Gadarenes. You're about to meet the Gadarean demoniac, or the demon man of the region of Gad. Turns out that Moses' promise came true. Their sin has found them out. Jesus steps foot off the boat, and a couple of guys, they come running and screaming at him. A naked guy living in a graveyard that cannot be bound with chains, that's not the best welcoming committee. He screams at Jesus, asking him, what have you to do with us, Jesus, son of the most high God? But notice something else. God takes the time to record the fact that the first thing that happens is this man just falls down before Jesus. This demon man recognizes the authority of Jesus and he acts accordingly. Jesus asks the demon, what's your name? And he answers, legion. <laughs> Y'all, that's a unit of 3,000 to 6,000 men in the Roman army. That's a bunch of demons. They beg Jesus that he would not torment them before their time. Our text says, a great herd of pigs was feeding there on the hillside at some distance from them. And the demons begged him to let them enter these. The demons take over a herd of 2,000 pigs and immediately the pigs run head first into the sea. This is just a side note, but it's worth mentioning. Jews, along with most all cultures of Jesus' day, believed that the sea was actually the portal to the underworld. 
The demon-possessed swine being driven into the sea was really a picture of sin being sent back to the place that it came from. It's a word picture of Jesus' forgiveness of this man's sin. Man, but that's a whole nother lesson. Let's get back to where we left off. The next thing that our text tells us is that when the herdsmen saw what happened, they ran to town and they told the people. And this didn't set well, so immediately those people run out to see what's going on. When they arrived, they found the demon man, get this, clothed, not naked anymore. Wow, do you see that? What a picture. It, Adam's sin caused him to be naked. And now this man is clothed. He's clothed, he's in his right mind, and he's sitting at the feet of Jesus. They scan the hills for their pigs, no sight of them. And here's where our lesson begins. The townspeople have just lost their income. Forget about the fact that they've made their living in an endeavor that God forbids. Forget about the fact that they've been tormented by this demon-possessed man for years and years. They're more afraid of lost income than they were of a demon-possessed lunatic. They didn't look at Jesus and exclaim, you rescued us, please move in and stay forever. No, they, they look at him and they beg him to leave. In absolute contrast, the Gadarean demoniac looks at Jesus and he has one request. Look at the text. It says, the man who had been possessed with demons begged him that he might be with him. This guy asked Jesus, can I go with you, please? It's all I want. I just want to be next to you, regardless of the cost. Then there's us. Jesus shows up on the doorstep of our life and confronts everything that strips us naked, torments us, shackles us, separates us from the people we love. He offers us freedom at a cost, but freedom with a reward, himself. So how will we respond? Do we cling to the pigs of our past or do we sit at the feet of our Savior with clean clothes and a renewed mind? The choice is ours and the time is now. Maybe we should spend some time with Him today deciding what we'll do with the choice that He sets before us. Thank you.